Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a special mission. There are arrests to be made. What will we be arresting, you might be curious? Well, a few weeks back, I asked you to send in what you thought were the big main crimes that the Netflix TV show has committed against The Witcher, the most important series in my life. I got a lot of very good responses, and today we'll be deciding whether they deserve the death sentence, aka if they actually break the TV show and the TV show cannot function with them, or if they can just get off with a warning, which in my head is like, this isn't great, but you can still make a 10 out of 10 TV show with this in place. Before we get into it, I'm really 50-50 on if this cap is gonna stay on the entire time. It does have Polizia with the Polish eagle on it. So again, authenticity proving to you that I'm Polish, right? Really blew the budget on this episode, didn't I? <laughs> Crime number one. Not every short story is included in the Witcher TV show. In my opinion, I don't think they could have ever included every single short story in season one. I do not think that all of them are necessary for the adaptation, especially the ones that are more self-contained, like for example, the little sacrifice story, even though I really, really like that story, it does, it's not really necessary to understanding core things about Geralt and the world, uh, even though it is very cool and I love S.C. Dalvin, but there are other short stories which, uh, not including them, fundamentally changes The Witcher. For example, the first Brokilon short story where Ciri meets Geralt, but I'll get into that a little bit later. So in my opinion, this is the first one that's gonna go into warning because again, it, it's really about the selection. The next crime that I'll go over is the lack of the Brokilon sequence. Uh, this is the Sword of Destiny short story that I'm referring to right now, which is where Ciri and Geralt first meet in the Brokilon forest. I know someone in the comments will be like, oh, Vera, but they did try to include it. After all, Ciri in season one does go to Brokilon and meets Dara and, and Malsak, who is not really Malsak because he's the evil Doppler that's trying to kill her, is going after her. I am not counting that at all. Because what is the point of the short story? Well, the point of it is to make you, the reader, care about this random child. Does this sequence in the TV show do anything to make us care for Siri? No, absolutely not. We're just following her running through the forest and it's really boring because we want to get back to Geralt. We don't care about this random kid. And that's why it's so important for us to see, first see Siri through the eyes of Geralt because this short story is one where at first Geralt is like, oh my God, what is this little princess doing in this forest where she is going to be killed? I'm taking her back to her grandmother. As the story progresses, we start to see Geralt really, I don't know, start to care for Ciri. The moment when he has to tell her a bedtime story. Oh man, that's just so funny and it's so cute. And it's so foundational to understanding why Siri ends up so attached to Geralt and why he becomes her safe place. I feel like not including this can very, very easily break uh, the entire show. That being said, they could have somehow included elements of this, but not included the full short story. So they tried to remedy this in season two, uh, mostly at Henry Cavill's urging. So thank you, Henry Cavill. They didn't succeed but I still feel like they could have if they had more competent writers or like a better uh, show direction. So for this reason, I'm going to put this into life in prison because again, it's not something that will immediately kill a show, but it is something that you better know what you're doing if you're omitting this uh, short story and they didn't. Okay, no, you know what? I'm, I'm taking it off. It's way too hot for the hat, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be right here. Since we're already talking about Siri, I think the best segue for us right now is to talk about the fact that they significantly aged her up. This is another interesting one because I can see what they were thinking. I think it would have been very hard to have an eight-year-old actress playing Siri for the entire thing, especially the sequences where she's training in Kaer Morin or even the Thanad coup. And so I understand why they wanted to age her up for that. What I don't understand is why they aged her up from the start. If I were the showrunner, I would have adapted the Sword of Destiny short story in Brokilon with a child actress, like an, an eight-year-old, so you really could see the father-daughter relationship start. 
and I don't know to have like almost this like cuteness reaction like oh my gosh it's a cute little baby in the forest that is trying to kill her and I have to protect it I don't know I don't know if I'm making sense but I, I think the audience would have a more intense reaction uh, to seeing this helpless kid in this murderous forest instead of a teenager running around later on I'm fine with the age up I think that concluding the season with the something more scene where Geralt and Ciri find each other after so many years was the correct choice. Too bad that we didn't have the foundation for the emotional punch that that could have packed. But I think it would have made sense if then at the very end we see the aged up Ciri and Geralt finding each other and they're like, oh my gosh, like we found each other through these terrible circumstances, but we're here together, so it's going to be okay. Uh, I also don't think that Ciri had to be a main character through the main season, through the first season. In terms of crime, it's something that's much easier to mess up and it's something that if you do mess up, you will fundamentally change the point of the story. And so for that reason, I'm going to put it in, you're getting more than the warning, you're spending the night, but then I'm letting you go. Speaking of Siri, I have another crime that uh, kind of ties into this. And it's, why is suddenly Siri so competent and such a badass fighter, you know, killing the monster on the ship, blah, 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 handling herself in the, what they attempted to do with the Beltane sequence. That is a worse crime than aging Siri up. So I'm telling you right now, you're getting a few years for that one. And it all ties back to Siri's story being a loss of innocence story. Why is this important? Well, in the infamous uh, episode of Siri being stuck in the desert, which got a lot of hate, but I hate to break it to you, it is it was always going to be a pretty boring episode because it's a pretty boring chapter. And it was quite book, well, it was more book accurate than a lot of the other stuff that the show did, which really isn't saying much, but it especially didn't work because we're not scared for Siri. Again, in the book, she's a literal child, so you are more terrified for her as she's wandering the desert and, you know, being almost killed by uh, the monster and dying from like heat stroke and stuff like that. Now. I still think that this could have worked with an aged up Siri, but this aged up Siri shouldn't have been shown to be so competent. She should have never been shown to be at a very comparable level to Geralt. For example, in the Sherowet sequence, congrats to Freya Allen. She looks great. She handles the choreography very well. In my opinion, Siri should have been shown to struggle a bit more because we know that no matter what she comes up against she is going to be able to handle it because she has killed monsters before. I think that really deserves a few years in prison. To finish up kind of talking about Siri, what about the other Witcher schools? In the segments where you play as Siri in The Witcher 3, the Wolf School medallion changes to a Cat School medallion. And if you don't know why that is, it's essentially because Siri finds a Cat School medallion a short time after the desert, I believe. Now, I don't know if they're going to give her a Cat School medallion in the TV show in season four, or if she's gonna just find a random Wolf School medallion. I mean, they already changed the fact that Cohen is from the Wolf School when he's supposed to be from uh, the Griffin School. In my humble opinion, it was so stupid of them to erase the other Witcher schools. From a world building standpoint, I think it makes Witchers way less interesting. But from a marketing standpoint, you could have sold so much merch. You could have, you know, done the whole quiz of which Witcher school are you? Oh, now that you found out that you're from the school of the whatever, you can buy the medallion for X amount of money. I mean, Harry Potter has done this with the Hogwarts houses and it's been a huge success for them. So why didn't we do this? Don't know. Truly, I thought Netflix wanted to make money and I'm baffled by some of their decisions. I'm gonna put this in, you're getting a few years. Keeping with the Witcher theme, why is Kaer Morin a brothel? Why? It is supposed to be a secret fortress in the mountains that blends in and that you're not able to find easily. Uh, in Blood of Elves, book three, we start the story with Triss going through these winding paths in the mountains and going to find this fortress. And she stumbles upon Ciri as she's uh, practicing on the trail. It's been a while since I reread Blood of Elves, but if I remember correctly, there were descriptions of Kaer Morin using the landscape to kind of blend into the mountains and hide so that if you don't know what you're looking for, you won't just stumble upon it. Well, The Witcher TV show decided to uh, host a party there and make it a brothel with, mind you, a lot of witchers. I truly want to know 
what was going through the heads of the writers when doing this. Also, in what world would Vesemir allow this? Yep, this is another one that changes something about the witchers, who are supposed to be super mega vigilant because of the catastrophe that happened a few years before. Um, that event was actually the inspiration of uh, the Vesemir anime, but when I say inspiration, I mean super, super loose inspiration, which is why I don't really talk about the Vesemir an anime. But yeah, Kaer Morin being a brothel, why? Which takes me to the person whose idea it was in the TV show to make Kaer Morin a party frat house for the night. And it was uh, who else but Eskel the tree. As a fan of Eskel and his goat, which again, you could have made cute goat plushies, but you didn't think of that, did you? Uh, R.I.P. Bleeder, you would have loved to be a mascot on uh, my bed. Eskel is one of the fan favorite characters and choosing between the two main witchers that people coming in from the video game would know about, uh, and those two being Lambert and Eskel, I don't see why you would choose Eskel to be the dick instead of Lambert, because I mean, we all know our favorite poem, Lambert, Lambert, what a dick. So I don't understand why Eskel was chosen to be the dick instead. Maybe it's because in the book, he really terrifies Siri because of his facial scars, but Still, I don't think that means that he should have been turned into a tree. I think it was just done for shock factor because they had loads of other unnamed witchers that they could have done this with. But no, they do it with Eskel just to, what, piss off the fans, I guess? I don't know. And then he's eaten by wolves, right? You know the saying, no witcher has ever died in his bed. Well, Eskel was the first one to die as a tree. Keeping in the vein of me getting angry over a uh, characters being fundamentally screwed over by the producers of the TV show. We have Sir Ike of Densley, or as we uh, will call him for this video, Sir Ike of Doofus, because that is what he is made of. For this one, you're gonna be spending the night. This is one that I'm really annoyed at, uh, but I guess if you needed to have some sort of comedic relief and Yarp and Zygrin wasn't enough for some reason, I, I guess you could have done this again. I don't understand why, because the entire tension between knights versus witchers is a very big part of the dragon's short story, but okay, if you wanted to have some comedic relief, there are other worse crimes that Netflix has committed. I don't endorse this. Worst crime is Dumb Dijkstra, which is going into death sentence. Dijkstra cannot be an idiot, and Dijkstra is an idiot, in the witcher tv show look no further than the season three coup on thanad episodes i think neon knight does a really good breakdown of this in one of his uh season review videos so check that out if you want like a more thorough analysis here's the thing right it's very difficult to write a character that's supposed to be smarter than everyone else and more than that he's supposed to be smarter than you because dijkstra is supposed to be this normal man who is at the same level politically as mages and kings and queens and all these crazy people. And he's only there because he is so intelligent, because he is five steps ahead of everyone. And in the TV show, you don't understand how he got there because he is such an idiot. He, like, I remember he decides to shackle up all the, all the mages in Dimeridium, which Dimeridium is, n neutralizes their power, but I believe also, like, hurts them a lot. So effectively, you're, he's not just shackling up the mages that he knows are against him. He's shackling up even the potential ones that would have supported him and effectively making more enemies for himself. And Dijkstra is such a, such a fan favorite and such an interesting character as well. And all of the, in, and a lot of the intrigue with Redania comes from the tension between Dijkstra and Philippa. So I feel like those two characters were super important to get right. And in the case of Dijkstra, especially, they just absolutely didn't. Okay, I'm making the executive decision to now just go over all of the other character mess ups that you guys submitted because I think I'm on a roll right now, so uh, let's go through them. The next big character that I think them not getting her right fundamentally breaks the entire TV show. And in fact, this one moment that I'm referencing is the thing that I think broke the TV show to such an extent that, that there is no way in which they could have fixed it afterwards. In my opinion, this is single-handedly and easily the biggest crime of this entire TV show. 
And that is, of course, uh, Yennefer trying to kill Ciri. The reason this fundamentally breaks the entire TV show afterwards is because it breaks the family dynamic of Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri. If Yennefer tries to kill Ciri, she loses her trust uh, with Geralt. Other than that, she loses that trust with Ciri and it goes back on, on all the foundational things that make Yennefer who she is. Yennefer is such an interesting story. She comes from this awful family that treated her so poorly. In the books, it's actually a rich family, which they changed for the TV show. Uh, she works her way through Eratuza and becomes this very powerful sorceress, very beautiful sorceress. And she's so blinded that by her ambition that when she finally reaches and has all the power that she could get, she realizes that, that she still doesn't feel fulfilled and that she has lost the ability to do the one thing that she always wanted to, and that's to have a child that she can raise and that a one that she can raise better and be better to than her parents were to her. And that internal struggle of, I worked so hard, I was so ruthless, I was so ambitious, and I have everything that that ambition could have granted me. It's, I'm so successful that I have like avenged my younger self that was never good enough, but I lost the ability to have a child and to have all this mean something, to carry this forth into a better new generation. I, I think that that makes Jennifer so, so interesting. So then when she meets Geralt and when she and him basically adopt Ciri, her bond with Ciri is so beautiful. Why? Why in the world would she try to kill her? That entire storyline of her losing her powers is BS created for the TV show and I'll get into that a bit later, but there's no reason that had to be there. It is single-handedly the biggest crime and one that you you just cannot come back uh, come back from. Sticking with uh, Yennefer for a second there, why is she attributed with other people's accomplishments? It's almost as if the writers don't understand who Yennefer is, and so they're like, well, she's clearly not interesting by herself, so we're gonna give her the accomplishments of other people to make her more interesting, I guess? Which to me is so ludicrous because you're making other characters worse for it. The things that pop into my mind are Yennefer for some reason creating the lodge, which is really ironic because in the books she's pretty much the one sorceress that is uh, against joining the lodge. Philippa Eilhart is the one who originally creates the lodge. In the books, uh, Vilgefortz is the hero of Sodden Hill. In the TV show, it's Yennefer, which this is the event that leads her to losing her powers for some reason. So again, why did we do that? I don't know because this takes away so much from other characters and it just honestly created so many problems like logic problems uh for making yennefer an interesting character by herself uh this is getting life in prison going from one character who tried to kill siri to another let's talk about vesemir who tries to kill siri for her elder blood which suddenly is the thing that creates witchers life in prison no okay i'm gonna try to make this more of a bell curve so i'm gonna put this in you're getting a few years vesemir would never do anything to try and kill Ciri. He is like the grandfather in this relationship. Now, the lore behind creating the witchers, if they didn't have any ideas of how to make the elder blood sound more interesting and more relevant, I don't know why you'd need to do that to something that literally has the able the ability to bend time and space, but let's say that's not interesting enough and you want to tie it more to the witchers or whatever. Uh, okay, I can see why they thought that maybe that could be a good idea, but the fact that then they just do that to Vesemir's character and have him have his uh, murderous tendencies, as I call them in uh, this tier ranker, again, it ruins the idea of, you know, these are supposed to be the good years. And Geralt and Yennefer think back on this, these years so fondly as well, which is why in this war-torn landscape, they tried so hard for the last few books to get back to the way everything was in the past. Why would they do that if they're all trying to kill each other and trying to use each other for nefarious purposes? Why would that, <laughs> why? Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any coherent logical sense. So yeah, you're getting a few years for that one as well. Speaking of witchers, Geralt is suddenly a silent brute. For those who don't know, the books are very dialogue dependent and Geralt is a very poignant philosopher in them um, at some points. But yeah, Geralt is very intelligent and he's very observant. And as I'm rereading The Last Wish for the fourth time, it is like even more apparent to me 
But then in the TV show, we get the hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, Henry Cavill, this is another thing that he really rallied for. He wanted Geralt past season one to be a bit more verbose, to have more things to say. Uh, so for that reason, because it gets better, I'm putting this in You're Spending the Night. Speaking of Dandelion and Geralt, uh, their friendship is not a friendship in the TV show. We don't get any sort of semblance of them being friends. Uh, well, we do get the side from Dandelion that he, and that he's very almost like fanboy-esque, but we never get the sense of why does Geralt hang around with this guy, especially since Dandelion has the tendency to get himself in a lot of trouble. It's almost kind of like a running gag in the books and then it's carried over into the video games that Geralt keeps saving Dandelion from being hanged. My boy really does like to uh, get himself in a near noose situation. But yeah, we never understand why Geralt sees Dandelion as a friend. This is another one where you're getting life in prison. Speaking of Dandelion, let's talk about his steamy new relationship with the hunk known as Radovid. A big point of The Witcher is kind of the subversion of a lot of typical fantasy tropes. Sapkowski, Sapkowski was very well versed in the literary canon, especially like the fantasy canon. And, and so he decided to write a fantasy which purposefully goes and subverts a lot of the tropes of the literary canon there. What he was kind of doing with Dandelion is, sure, at first glance, he's the womanizer, he's uh, flamboyant and blah blah blah. But when you really stop and think about it, he's a very feminine guy who is amazing at writing poetry, at writing songs that really resonate with people and that are able to capture some truths, even if he is like twisting them. He's kind of like the Taylor Swift of The Witcher, and he is still able to get, you know, just as many ladies interested in him, not for him being like a meat sack with, you know, muscles and blah, blah, blah. And him being emotionally intelligent is what makes him so attractive. What the Netflix screenwriter said, they said, well, we have a feminine guy, stereotypically are gay, so we're gonna change his sexuality because obviously every feminine guy ever is gay, of course, yes. And who could be his partner? Hmm, remember that child, child, who becomes a very interesting character in The Witcher 3, which we are not taking any inspiration from. How about we age this child up, make him an idiot, because obviously that's what we do here. We make every interesting character an idiot, especially the ones known for being smart, and we're gonna make him the love interest. Because obviously the guy that sleeps around a lot and is feminine is gonna be gay, right? Like, honestly, I, I'm shocked that more people didn't like call this out for being problematic, <laughs> because honestly, pick any other character in The Witcher, change their sexuality, it would be probably better than picking Dandelion. And the, the th other thing that kind of really makes me angry about this is that it took screen time away from Siri and her love interest. The way their relationship starts is very problematic in the books. And I think that if they took some time to create some sexual tension between Siri and this character, it could have been so much more interesting and so much more, I don't know, cute and romantic when they do get together later on and less exploitative, which is kind of the vibe that it has, especially at the start in the books. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really wish that we would have spent this time uh, with Siri exploring her sexuality more than uh, deciding to take Dandelion and play into the stereotype. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's just it's just very disappointing. And justice for Siri and her partner, whose name I'm not saying because I don't want to spoil it for you in case you haven't read it, or in case you're still for some reason excited to check out season four. Next, Kahir is evil. Okay, this totally personal preference. I love Kahir. I, I love, love, love Kahir. He is my little cutie patootie of this series. Okay, like if you watched my Malazan video, you knew, you know that I absolutely lost my marbles when talking about Crocus. And uh, Kahir is my Crocus in The Witcher. Kahir's entire thing is that when we first meet him, he's the Black Knight with the helmet with the feathers, and he's this figure, this uh, not human even, but this just terrifying monster that Siri sees in her dreams. Geralt hates him because we don't know what this knight did to Siri, and it's implied that maybe he even raped her. So we don't know, and it's really scary. But then, 
uh, during the fall of Thanid, we find out that he is just a boy carrying out his orders, scared for his life as well. He doesn't know why he's doing this. He just knows what the consequences will be. When he goes to find Siri first during the fall of Sintra, he doesn't question it. It's just another command that he has to follow. And in some sense, like he did save her life in the end, right? When the mask is taken off and Siri sees him, she realizes that she doesn't hate him anymore. She's not terrified of him, of her, of him anymore. That he was never inherently truly evil. And then Kahir later on joins the Hansa and helps Geralt find Siri and uh, participates in the final battle and stuff like that. And I, I really, really love Kahir. So why does the Kahir in the show have to be genuinely evil? And then he magically has a change of heart in that one scene because they have to have the showdown between Siri and Kahir because that's what happened in the books, except in the books, Kahir isn't actually evil. So of course the TV show just has like Kahir for some reason throw down his sword, kneel in front of Siri and be like, kill me, kill me. And then Siri is like, oh, I'm not gonna kill you. Oh, for a reason, for a reason, I don't know. And then uh, Kahir, what like, stands in the field uh, to take on like the three riders on the horses. Again, I, I'm trying to find the logic in this. Uh, there is none, unfortunately. But yeah, the fact that they are taking one of my personal favorite characters and doing this to him really hurts my heart. So you're getting life imprisonment for that. Next, Vilgefortz is nerfed. I'm between death sentence and life in prison. I'm gonna put it in death sentence because I feel like Vilgefortz is never as terrifying as he should be. Oh, by the way, might I just say, if there's anything that Netflix did correct is casting Vilgefortz and his crew, Lydia, Ryans, and uh, Vilgefortz were cast perfectly, perfectly. Why is Vilgefortz nerfed? This kind of ties into what I said before about Yennefer for some reason being the savior of S Sodden Hill uh, when it should have been Vilgefortz. Uh, there is no reason that Vilgefortz should have been beaten by Kahir in season one. Of course, you can make the argument that he was trying like not to show his like full power or whatever. I also think that us finding out that he is gonna be evil or that there's something not quite right with him from the start was a mistake because figuring out, especially during the Thanet coup, that he is actually the evil mastermind behind everything could have been really interesting. Of course, I don't think that uh, the Netflix uh, writers could have handled that, but I do think that would have been very interesting. But yeah, he is the big baddie. And so the fact that he is so nerfed and, and really not taken as seriously as I think that he should be, I think is something that really destroys the interesting element of uh, like, who we are fighting against. You know, like it says that there's the saying of uh, your show is only as strong as its antagonist. And I feel like we could have done so much more with Vilka Forts. Okay, and for the last character that I wanna talk about with, who I already did kind of talk about before is Yennefer. And the fact that she lacks any sort of poise, any sort of elegance, any sort of je ne sais quoi. I'm mostly talking about season two onwards. And yes, I am referring to the Firefucker! <laughs> Yennefer would never say that! Never! Yennefer, uh, yeah, Yennefer would never, ever say that. Can you, um, okay, can you imagine Witcher 3 Yennefer being like, mm, oh yeah, remember Ryans the Firefucker? Ryans, in Polish I say Ryans, but I don't know. I, I'm gonna say Ryans for the uh, purposes of this video. Uh, you can't imagine that. She wouldn't do that. It's honestly funny trying to imagine it. So why does Yennefer in the TV show do this? Well, because of the sloppy writing. Again, Yennefer tied with Savinda Glockta from First Law is my favorite female character of all time. So personally, I'm putting this into life in prison because this hurts my soul. Uh, literally every single time she was like, firefucker. I lost a brain cell. And it's really such a shame because I feel like the one scene where I was like, wow, you had so much potential. This could have been a fantastic Yennefer. And that's the scene in season one in the ball when she comes out after her transformation. The makeup they did on her, the, the hair, the eyeshadow, the costume. I was like, that is Yennefer. That is my Yennefer. I, yes. Why did this not continue on to seasons two and three? I don't know. And to cap off kind of my Yennefer rantings, uh, the botched Dear Friend letters, the fan favorites, which if you need to know anything about Yennefer's personality, just read the Dear Friend letters. You're getting a few years for this. Definitely getting a few years for this. 
The point of the dear friend letters is Yennefer being passive aggressive to Geralt because Geralt can't really commit to her and he calls her his dear friend. And so Yennefer writes back a letter where she's like, dearest friend, bleh, you know, and, and she's so passive aggressive, but she's so witty and uh, it's just everything. I love the dear friend letters. Um, what are they in the TV show, you might ask? Well, uh, season three, a lot of it is spent trying to fix the ending of season two where she tries to kill Siri, And the dear friend letter is her being like, Geralt, my dearest friend, I'm so sorry for trying to kill your adopted daughter. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going to talk about a few minor things now that personally annoy me. Uh, first one, mispronunciation, especially Melly Telly. Every time I hear that, I want to, like, rage quit. It's Melitele, not Melitele. Also, um, Skellige. It's not Skellig, Skellige. For me, in the games, it is pronounced Skellige. In Polish, Skellige. So, you, you know what? Just stay with that pronunciation. Uh, don't change it. So yeah, for this one, once again, you're getting a few years because you really pissed me off. Another thing. Uh, the fact that they keep saying, destiny, 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 destiny will unite them. Uh, they even had like the posters for one of the seasons being like, destined to whatever, blah, blah, blah. Think that they fundamentally don't understand the books because the point is that, yeah, everyone harks on about destiny, but in the end, destiny isn't enough. That's why, that's why Geralt says, uh, when Siri asks him, am I your destiny, Geralt? Geralt says, you are so much more than that. Uh, so once again, uh, life in prison. Next, uninspired costumes. This one, I know that in season one, there were uh, communication issues between the showrunner and the costume designer. And I think that costume designer actually had to work on like shortened uh, schedule, something like that. I don't know. Uh, so I don't know. I do have some empathy for uh, the costume designer, especially if it was a not great work environment to be in. Uh, so I'll give it some grace. That being said, very little Slavic influences. In my other Witcher videos, I tried to wear uh, something that was, you know, Slavic inspired or traditional Polish inspired. Uh, and of course, I'm not expecting, uh, you know, the sorceresses to be wearing Vianki all the time to have uh, someone pull up in Kierpce or whatever. You could have, you know, some fabrics that are inspired by works on the Shudelko whatever you know you, you could have something and i think that the games really nailed it of course i feel like the witcher 3 dialed it up to 100 but i feel like going too far with the slavic influence is better than not going far enough and i think that the games did a very good job of giving the different characters their own looks uh even if they do kind of exaggerate some things like famously tris marigold she's supposed to have uh kashta nove vosy, which translates to uh, chestnut hair, which I don't know in English when I say chestnut hair, I think more like brown, but when I say kashtanova, I think like dark auburn, uh, or not even dark auburn. Like, I'll show a picture on screen what I interpret kashtanova to mean. Uh, also, if you just search up kashtanova vosy, that's kind of what shows up. So, that's the hair that she's supposed to have theoretically in the books. Famously, in the video game, she's given like a fire engine red hair. Uh, the only character in the Lodge of Sorceresses that is supposed to have fire engine red hair is actually Ida, and she doesn't appear in the Netflix TV show. Also, personal pet peeve, Henry Cavill's outfit in The Thanad Coup is the most ugly thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, shout out to the Balsack armor, uh, RIP. Because I'm giving grace uh, to the costume designer, I'm going to put this into You're Spending the Night. Next, Geralt's eyes are weird. So this is a fun one, and I don't know if you remember, but at the start when we got that first look at Henry Cavill as Geralt, uh, it received loads of criticism, mostly for the wig, <laughs> but there was a lot of conversation about his eyes and the contacts and how weird and like out of this world they looked. And I think that, you know, to some extent, he's a witcher and his eyes, witcher eyes are often described as very, very unsettling. So. I think that they, them leaning into this like, you know, weird contact looking eye could be on purpose. Uh, but a lot of people had the problem that, oh, in the video game, he has the cat eye slit all the time and here he never has the cat eye slit. Uh, so what's up with that? 
Uh, and as I was rereading The Last Wish, uh, I actually got the answer for what they are supposed to be. And it turns out the game and the TV show both got it wrong, but that's fine. I think that in the game, uh, you know, the cat eye is very stylized and it gives the witchers a distinctive look. Um, so even though lore-wise, it kind of contradicts the point of the cat eyes, uh, it's fine because artistically it looks more interesting. Uh, whereas in the TV show, it doesn't, it, it's not as interesting as having the full on cat eye the entire time, but it is more accurate to what witcher eyes are look like day to day. Basically what it says in the book is that the witcher eye is yellow uh, and that they can control the constriction of uh, the pupil kind of like a cat. What I'm referencing, what I'm referencing in the book specifically is when he wakes up after his night with Iola, literally, this is literally right after the first short story when we go back to the framing narrative, uh, when he's being healed in the temple of Malitele. And he wakes up and it's he's described as shielding his, uh, shielding his eyes from the sunlight and that it's an instinct or and that it's a reflex that he never got rid of despite not needing it because he could just constrict his pupil like a cat and block out the sunlight that way. What I'm getting at is the pupil does both. Uh, this is just gonna go into warning because you know you could make the eyes look a bit too out of this world and like look really stupid but I feel like they handled them quite okay. Oh the no Slavic look um, with the costumes and stuff I kind of touched upon that already. Uh, I feel like the uh, architecture, which I touched upon in my Witcher ranking video, um, that was really such a pity. So since I already kind of talked about this already, I'm going to put this into life in prison. And because I already talked about the Witcher elder blood creation thing when I talked about Vesemir's murderous tendencies, I'm gonna put this in uh, you're getting a few years as well. <sighs> okay, now I do have to talk about this because there's just no way I can. I know some people would bring this up in the comments if I didn't put this in, so I'm going to talk about it now. But it is the fact that the showrunners decided to disregard the iconic looks of uh, many of the characters, and I'm referring mainly to the casting choices. Uh, like I talked about already, there was a lot of controversy when Anya was cast. There is a lot of talk also around Fringilla's casting and stuff like that. This cast is very competent. They could have had a 10 out of 10 Witcher TV show with this cast. It was a matter of how they were written. Some casting choices that I agree with, uh, some casting choices that I disagree with. For example, despite Philippa being white in the books, I think that the actress that they chose has the charisma, the facial expressions, the presence on screen that Philippa Eilhart should have. I also think that she is always styled very well, you know, in the owl feathers and stuff like that. And I think that despite not matching what she is described as in the books, that actress for me 100% works as Philippa. I think she's fantastic. I think that the Fringilla Vigo actress, she's fine uh, by herself. I think Anya works as Yennefer as well. But later on in the books, uh, Fringilla has to look pretty much like Yennefer's twin. So I think that if they wanted to do the race swap, either cast two um, African-American actresses or cast two actresses of Indian descent because they just, they have to look very similar. And then you have some casting that like race wise was I guess correct, but I think was the absolutely incorrect choice. For example, full test, I'm so pissed off at who they cast for full test. Again, no hate to the actor, get your money king, good on you, but man, full test is supposed to be young, handsome, intelligent, and instead they cast an older actor and wrote full test as being a bumbling fool who deserves no respect. That's just so stupid to me because because that's so antithetical to everything that Foltest is. Uh, Foltest is one of the only kings uh, that Geralt actually respects at any point in the Witcher series. Uh, same thing with Villain Treadenmirth. I don't understand why uh, he was aged up. Dragons are revered in Zeracania. Zeracania is African inspired. I, I feel like a good 
choice for representation in the TV show would have been to cast uh, an up-and-coming young Black actor for that role, uh, especially since, again, Villain Treadon Mirth is such a fan favorite. He is so charismatic. And his what he says to Geralt and Yennefer sticks with them through the rest of the series. So I think it would have been a really good episodic highlight for an up-and-coming Black actor. Again, I don't really want to talk about this. I don't want to get too political on this channel. But I knew that if I didn't say anything, people would write comments about it anyway. So yeah, uh, I'm putting this into warning because again, we could have had a 10 out of 10 TV show with this cast. And I think that bullying the cast is not okay. It truly is the writer's fault and the showrunner's fault for writing these characters incorrectly or styling them wrong, as I already kind of said. Okay, let's try to speed through these last ones because this video is getting long enough and it's really hot. I don't know if you can see uh, the amount I'm sweating. Let's go over the geography problems. The first problem is everything kind of looks the same uh, geography wise and people are just teleporting pretty much across the entire continent. You're getting a few years for that. I feel like it's so stupid that they don't have a map included in the TV show. I don't know whether they would do it like Game of Thrones style or I don't know, have it in the post credits or whatever, but I don't know, just give some sort of semblance of how big this world is. Also the fact that they're like teleporting from anywhere to anywhere uh, in a matter of seconds, it's, it's just so stupid. And the fact that everything just looks the same is really dumb as well. You have either desert or forest and nothing in between. Next. Magical areas look boring. Life in prison, uh, especially Brokilon, it is supposed to look like this jungle with these magical dryads. Dude, if Gamora can look good with her green skin in Avengers, then I'm sure that you can body spray paint a few of the actresses in the background. If that messes up with your green screen, guess what? There are two other skin colors dryads can be, yellow or brown. Put some glitter on the actresses to make them look shiny. I don't know, uh, I'm sure you can find some body glitter for fairly cheap or give them that weird Galadriel effect where she's super shiny. Also, magical areas, why is Dol Blathana a desert? Don't know, it's supposed to be the Valley of the Flowers. Well, it's like the Valley of the Shrubs. Not very interesting. Continuing on with that, dwarves and elves have no separate identity. We get a little bit into the elves with Sherowed finally being shown, but again, uh, the entire story of Falka is kind of twisted. Dwarves, I don't even think we ever heard of Mahakam in the series. If we did, we didn't really find out what it is. Uh, season one, time jumps. Of course, there had to be time jumps, but I think they should have done a framing narrative the way that it's done in the book because this circumvents this problem of needing to know when everything takes place. So again, uh, really stupid. You're getting a few years for that. They could have done this well if they gave some sort of like time description of where things are happening, uh, but they didn't. So I don't know why they did that. Next, character and storyline bloat. What this is referring to is all the useless side plots and characters that aren't in the books and that no one cares about and they mess with the story. For example, the Baba Yaga character in season two, all the stuff going on with Fringilla and the elves that no one cares about. And like the fact that we're following Kahir for some reason and he's being evil, no one needs that. All the random mages that I don't even remember their names, but they are there. They take up screen time for what reason? I don't know. Character and storyline bloat, unacceptable. Next, ripping off the video game and then saying that we're not using any inspiration from the video game. First of all, uh, the theme is very similar. Going back to the Baba Yaga thing, the, let's be real. The only reason why they included that character was because of Gontaro Dim and because Gontaro Dim is a very popular fan favorite character. Uh, very interesting, you know, G.O.D. Is he the god of this universe? I don't know. An original character created by Tzede Projekt. So, Witcher Netflix was like, oh my gosh, let's make a character like that and take away Yennefer's power and then make her kill, attempt to kill Ciri because obviously that's what would happen. But no, they're not taking any inspiration from the video, video games at all. Again, life imprisonment. If they were smart, they would have adapted the books more faithfully and then got the rights to adapt the video games, which actually uh, do fulfill the prophecy that is talked about throughout the entirety of the books. And then they could have had even more seasons, even more money. It would have been good. 
they were too dumb for that, so they didn't do it. And then, ignoring the beast cherry. I'm gonna stop zooming through this one because this is one that I actually really want to focus on. And it's also the last one. There's a reason why people for The Witcher get very annoyed by The Witcher TV show ignoring the beast cherry. They could have done their own little spin on it, even though the spin that they did do on it with the obelisks was really stupid. Maybe they shouldn't have done their own spin on it. But there are so many monsters in Slavic mythology and the other mythologies that Sapkowski pulls from that they could have used and they didn't. And also, the ones that they did, they sometimes mess up. And what I'm talking about specifically is my boy villain Treadenmirth, the dragon, who is not a dragon, he is a wyvern in the show. I get it that Game of Thrones popularized dragon uh, wyverns looking like dragons, but that doesn't matter for those because they don't have a bestiary, they don't have a main character who is a monster hunter. Guess what does have a character who's a monster hunter and there's a bestiary and a very big part of a certain little girl's education of self-defense is learning the different types of monsters and how to to defeat the different types of monsters. Um, yeah, it's the Witcher. So they should have followed the bestiary a little bit better. And I'm not saying that they should have just taken the video game's bestiary, but do some research about these creatures or whatever. Uh, dragon dragons, the way that they're differentiated in the Witcher is that they have four legs and then they have the wings. First off, Villain Tread and Mirth's design is really ugly and stupid and not imposing, not majestic, and he is supposed to be both of those things. And then second of all, uh, it's a wyvern. It's a wyvern. Uh, also, uh, in the wyvern battle scene that Ciri uh, does later on, that could have been such an epic scene. It's such a good scene in the books where she's in the arena and blah, 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 and the wyvern comes out and, and in the TV show, it's just in like some back alley and it's like this little thing in a cage. Also, if you didn't have the CGI budget to create like a cool imposing dragon in season one, you could have kept Villain Tread and Mirth in the shadows. You could have just done a head. So not adhering to the bestiary, in my opinion, especially since this is one of those things that really separate, separates the Witcher from uh, its contemporaries, uh, was a huge mistake. <sighs> that was all for me. I hope you enjoyed my breakdown of the crimes of Witcher Netflix. If you enjoyed this type of video, then be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I love reading comments, discussing things uh, with you. I try to reply to as many as I can in the week that the video has been published. I'm sure that there are some problems that with The Witcher that I missed. If there are any more that you'd like to me to discuss, then maybe I'll do a part two of this video sometime in the future. Uh, anyways, that's all for me and I hope that you enjoyed this video. Until next time, bye!